Hello everybody, welcome back to the Marshal. Today we're gonna be watching Napoleon, uh, Birth of an Emperor, the first part of a three-part series by Geo History. I'm a big fan of the Napoleonic Wars and of Napoleon himself, I find it a very fascinating period. You know, with one with a guy from basically nothing to it that becomes emperor through skill and uh, determination. So yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what this will will be about. Anyway, let's watch the video. The story begins in 1768 in Corsica. For centuries, the island was a Genoese possession. But separatist revolts forced Genoa to ask help from the French army. In the end, the sovereignty of the island is ceded to France. The following year... And one of the rebel families involved in... Uh, the Corsican rebellion against Genoa was actually the Bona uh, Bonaparte family at this time, and one of the yeah, and um, I'm pretty sure that Leticia, aka Napoleon's mother, what was pregnant at the time that some of the battles were going on, and uh, of course the famous general Pascal Pauli, who is a Corsican rebel f uh, independence fighter. He's, he's of course involved in these battles against the French, the Genoese and later the French. And, um, and he would become one of the, one of Napoleon's few, um, idol, fi idol figures. Uh, uh, one of his, like, one of the people he admires a lot during his uh, childhood. One of the people who really, who he really idolizes, like, as like a Corsican national fighter. And, uh, a symbol of Corsican nationalism. But um, yeah, Napo yeah, Napoleon was born just after this had happened, and Corsica became a territory of France. Napoleon Bonaparte is born into a noble family from Ajaccio. He grows up with his seven brothers and sisters. Noble in name, however, he was by French standards quite kind of poor. They lived in kind of, and they didn't really have a lot of money, but there were sort of a privileged family in Corsica and they and of course as Corsicans they were looked down upon by the French uh, in the mainland of course and when he turns nine is sent to the military school in Brienne Champagne Napoleon a good student is admitted to the military academy in Paris where he specializes in artillery the I'm pretty sure that he's the first Corsican in all of history I may be wrong about that but I'm I'm pretty sure he's one of the first Corsicans uh, he's the first Corsican to ever be admitted into the Paris Acad the military academy in Paris. Um, I'm also he was also I think he was one of one of twelve students from his original school out of like I think it was eighty or something that actually got into artillery. So that really says something about his ability, I think. The following year, at age 16, he is appointed second lieutenant of the artillery in Valence. In France, the economic situation is catastrophic. The Seven Years' War and the American Revolutionary War have emptied the coffers of the country. Louis XVI, struggling with the country's financial difficulties, summons to Versailles representatives of the clergy, the nobility and the Third Estate, that is the people, there was also a massive drought that happened in the years up to the revolution. A cold winters combined with not very good uh, harvest made that made that pri that bread stuff like bread prices skyrocketed, and the economy slowly began to really, really go down. And yeah, the wars that happened before American Revolutionary War, Seven Year War, and the Austrian War of Succession, all these wars just absolutely drained the monarchy's uh, financial finances and yeah revolution was kind of inevitable inevitable by that point to find a solution to the crisis after disagreements third estate officials seized power by founding the national assembly while in paris insurgents take over the royal fortress of bastille the revolutionaries vote for ending feudal privileges and adopt the Declaration of the Rights of the Man and the Citizen. Partially written by Thomas Jefferson of America. 
King Louis the 16th is then forcibly taken to Paris from where he later tries to flee with his family to a royalist stronghold but they are spotted and stopped on the way Initially, European monarchies remain mute about the French Revolution, seeing the weakening of their French competitor as a good thing. But yeah, many of these countries are rivals of France. Austria has been a long-time rival. Of course, there's Great Britain, always a French rival. And Prussia just been at war with France. So yeah, a lot of these nations, at first they kind of view it as a positive thing, the weakening. But eventually, because out of hand, they realize that it can be potentially dangerous for them too. But the arrest of Louis XVI make them fear that revolutionary ideas might spread across the continent and threaten their thrones. Prussia and Austria then combine forces to try and restore the French monarchy. War breaks out with the French armies in poor, which is pretty impressive, I think, because Prussia and Austria had just been a, had been a couple of couple of decades before there had been a war with each other in the Seven Years' War. Um, so the fact that they are going together and makes the declaration of Pilnitz, which is a Prussian declaration by, I think, the Duke of Brunswick, where he basically says that if the king dies, I will destroy uh, Paris and, and France and generally. generally. And yeah, I think that's... And um, yeah, so they, them going together like this really says something about how serious it is, the revolution, how seriously they, how serious they see it. Because suddenly, they put all rivalry aside to stamp out this one revolution in France. So, yeah. Condition. Facing the Allied army advance on Paris, the revolutionaries panic and execute all opponents of the revolution. But eventually... Napoleon himself was actually a witness at these massacres in Paris. He was in Paris at the time. He saw uh, stuff like... Uh, the king being forced to wear, uh, I, I don't remember what's called, the red hat of the revolution. He was also a witness of when a mob stormed the Tuileries, the Tillery, the Tuileries and um, executed the Swiss Guard and stuff like that. So yeah, he actually saw these things himself. Eventually, an unexpected victory of the French army pushes the coalition back beyond the country's borders. The revolutionaries regain confidence and proclaim the Republic. Louis XVI is then tried and guillotined, further angering European monarchies. The coalition strengthens, while on the French side, conscriptions swell up the ranks of the army. And it was, uh, I don't remember his first name, but it was War Minister Carnot who really got the army together and organized it in a way that actually helped uh, win the war against the coalition, the first coalition. I'm pretty sure that's wrong. I'm pretty sure that Russia wasn't involved in the war at this time. I think it was over for the second coalition where they were involved. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think they are clear one first coalition. Within the country, clashes between royalist and counter-revolutionary forces cause civil wars. Napoleon, the Federalist, he, he mentions the Federalist revolts. Some of these were Royalist or, or Catholics or, you know, stuff like that who wanted to maintain the monarchy. Others were what they, what we would call Federalist, essentially individuals who were afraid that too much power was centralized in Paris and that the radicalism in Paris, because Paris is where most of the Jacobins, you know, the radical factions with guillotines and Robespierre and stuff like that, they are afraid that the radicalism of Paris will spread around the country and to other, other cities. And that if too much power is centralized in Paris, then uh, other cities would lose influence. So federalists are essentially people who, in a way, support the revolution. However, they are against, um, uh, well, against centralization in Paris and want, um, and want saw a, federal a federation. Others are royalists who just want the monarchy back. In and his family who support the revolution. Some of these federalists actually were independence fighters, as we will see in Corsica. Revolution are driven away by Corsican separatists. In Toulon, royalists support of Britain and Spain that enter the harbour of Toulon with their armies. 
After the French army fails to retake the city, Napoleon is summoned to replace the artillery commander who was injured. Assessing the situation, he suggests a new plan. Instead of attacking from the north, he proposes seizing the forts south of the harbour to install his artillery and attack the Allied fleet. And the overall commander of the Siege of Toulon, I think his name was Cato, was an incompetent general who just didn't know what to do. The thing is that many of the officers this time in the, in the French army were persecuted and executed because they were afraid of what happened with, with General de Maurier up in the wind and his defection would happen en masse. So they began to persecute many of the officers. So Cato, I think that's his name, was incompetent, but he was loyal to the revolution. That's why he was in command. But he didn't really get stuff done. And what Napoleon is doing here is that he's trying to make uh, the Allies' positions in Toulon untenable. He's trying to hit that to the supply lines. Because what's the point of having the city if you can't supply it? His plan proves successful, and the city is taken back in two days. Napoleon's decisive intervention earns him a promotion. But in Paris, a new coup overthrows the government and Napoleon loses his title. A year later, a royalist revolt breaks out in Paris. The A actually goes to jail for a bit of time. And then he's, he's incredibly unpopular because he was a Jacobin previously. And, um, and the government didn't really trust him. So there were some who said that he was... So that he, at one point he was ordered to go to Vendée. Uh, to fight in the war there, in a war that had no glory in his eyes. He was also, at one point, tried to become a military advisor to the Ottoman Empire, I think. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. But he eventually gets his rank back and, um, yeah, take it by taking down the coup of 13 von der Meer, I think it was. And he is put in charge of quelling the rebellion giving him an opportunity to prove his loyalty for the new government. He orders his men to fire on the crowd, killing 200 people and ending the insurgency. As a reward, Napoleon is given... And at, this, and at, 18, at 13 von der Meer, he met Shoki Mura, who helped him get the cannons, in, cannons to stop the royalists. And yeah, they would become very close in the near future. ...command of the French army of Italy. Before leaving Paris, Napoleon marries Josephine, with whom he had fallen madly in love. She is the widow of a guillotined Viscount and a mother of two. Napoleon joins his army, which he finds in poor state. His men are poorly fed, badly equipped and no longer paid. Napoleon would assume the role of their charismatic leader and motivates his troops by promising them the riches of northern Italy. At this time, two armies are stationed there a Piedmontese army and an Austrian one. Napoleon is outnumbered and knows that if both armies unite, he would have no chance. His plan is to speedily advance his troops, place them in between both armies and fight them separately. On April 10, he launches something he would do many times in the future. He will, one of his trademark mark tactics is to get in between the armies to make sure they don't unite and just destroy them separately, which he's about to do here against Colley's Piedmontese army and Bullius Austrian. ...launches his attack. The plan works, and after a few battles, he defeats the Kingdom of Sardinia. Reeling from the attack, the Austrian army retreats to Milan and stations some troops along the Po River to prevent Napoleon from crossing. Napoleon sends over a small part of his army as a diversion while the bulk of his troops cross the river further east. This move threatens to break the Austrian line of communication, thus... In classic Napoleon, send a diversion to, um, to, dis to distract the army while he goes another route. The, uh, he, go, he takes a route that nobody expected and then gets behind them and forces them to retreat isolating its army, which then withdraws from Milan without fighting and flees eastward. For a year, Napoleon maintains an advantage thanks to his troops' speedy movement and because Austrian forces divide itself into smaller armies. Eventually, Napoleon's army threatens Vienna, forcing the Emperor of Austria to seek an armistice. Napoleon negotiates and himself signs a peace treaty. He obtains the... And around this time, 
he meets Sean Baptiste Bernadotte. I think it's just about the end of the campaign. I think after Arcole or something, he meets Bernadotte. And Bernadotte would become one of his main marshals and later marry the fiance, his Napoleon's previous fiance. Uh, uh, what was her name? In? Desiree Clary was her name. Who is the sister of Napoleon's brother, Joseph Bonaparte's wife, um, Julie Clary was her name. And he will become one of the main characters in all of the Napoleonic Wars. Annexation of the Austrian Netherlands and pushes the boundaries of the country to the Rhine. Austria receives the Republic of Venice and recognizes the new Italian republics created by Napoleon. Upon his return to Paris, Napoleon is welcomed as a hero. The government now asks him to invade Britain, the last enemy of France. But England has control over the seas and Napoleon is aware of the risk that this entails. Yeah, he, they were actually, they were, those plans actually went pretty far. They had prepared fleets along the coast and stuff like that. However, Napoleon didn't trust it and didn't think he could do the job. So um, he goes over to Egypt instead. He instead suggests attacking Britain where they least expect it. By seizing Egypt, he thinks he can threaten the important colony of India. The and actually some sultans, I, I think it was sultan or something like that. Although there were actually some states in India who that were aligned with the French and willing to help them. So there was actually a, maybe a realistic chance for an invasion of India because there was actually lo local support for the French there. Government accepts the proposal. As for them, this young general, who is a bit too ambitious and influential, is less dangerous while he is on mission. Napoleon leaves from Toulon with hundreds of ships carrying a 40,000 man army. Along the way, he captures Malta, while British Admiral Nelson, not knowing Napoleon's final destination, tries looking for him. Nelson reaches Alexandria before Napoleon and continues searching for him northward. Tales. Uh, oops. Proposal. As for them, hundreds of ships carrying a. Sorry. While British Admiral Nelson. Alexandria before Napoleon and continue searching for him northward. I'm pretty sure that when they, at one point there, the two she, the two fleets actually get really close to another to one another. I will, I've, the French fleet, I think it was it stopped. And was forced to turn off all lights to make sure that it didn't alert the British and stuff and, so, and stuff like that. Because they, they were actually really close to each other when the British left Alexandria and the French was just about to sail in. Napoleon lands near Alexandria in the Ottoman province of Egypt. He captures the city and then goes on further south. At the gates of Cairo, he defeats the Mamluk army and seizes the city. But in the north, British ships eventually find the... By the way, the famous Battle of the Pyramids did, was not fought at the Pyramids. That's a Napoleonic propaganda piece. It is correct that they could kind of see the Pyramids for the, for, from the area. However, it's nowhere near the Great Pyramids that Napoleon, that the Napoleon, Napoleon and Mamluks fought, fought each other. That's just not true. You could kind of vaguely see it in the, the pyramids in the distance, distance, but yeah, it was a line Napoleon he came up with. The French fleet and completely destroy it. Napoleon and his I don't remember find his... themselves stuck in Egypt. I don't remember his name, but the French admiral leading the um, the uh, the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile, he actually got like. He got hit by a cannonball and got split in two, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was a devastating battle. They only had like two ships left, I think. This information spreads in Europe and leads to the creation of a second anti-French coalition joined by the Ottoman Empire. Napoleon then goes back to the east, seizing towns along the way and begins the siege of Akko. But the Ottoman resistance, supported by the British, prevents the city from being captured. Napoleon then hears that the British are preparing for the landing of an Ottoman army in Alexandria. The siege went terribly for the French. At one point, I'm pretty sure that at one point they were forced, they simply ran out of artillery, so they were forced to fire the same shots that the Ottomans had fired at them, 
back at the Ottomans because they simply didn't have any more shot at left. Alexandria. He leaves to fight them and wins the battle with the last soldiers he had available. Hearing about the complicated situation in France, he travels alone, leaving behind his army. Um, he actually had orders from the government of France to return. Those orders just never uh, came to him in time. And Clipper was the one who le left, uh, led the expedition from there. He would, of course, die um, at the Battle of Helepolis on the same day that Napoleon won the Battle of Marengo and they say died. When he reaches France, the situation is tense. Austrian and Russian armies retake northern Italy, while Paris suffers from political instability. Napoleon, supported by the people and the army, involves himself in a coup and is named as a first council for the following 10 years. He is now head of the country and can reform it at will. He consolidates power and prepares a new army the to coup, reconquer the north. The coup actually went, uh, had mixed results. He, he basically walks into the chamber of elders, I think, uh, the, the council of 300, I think it's called, or something like that, or 500. I don't, I don't remember the exact name, but he goes into to them and basically declares that Paris is in danger and that they are enemies. And then he is thrown out, then thrown out of there. He's forced to be saved by a grenadier, uh, a group of grenadiers led by Morat. And it's Lucian, believe it or not, who his brother who kind of, you know, Gets, gets the councils and uh, uh, the chamber of elders, I think it's called, and got them together, or the remnants of them together, and made them, may and forced them to kind of make the decision that Napoleon should become first, con first consul. North of Italy. To Austria's surprise, he crosses the Great St. Bernard Pass, usually deemed impassable, and wins a battle against the Austrians. A second victory further north, Marengo is of course famous because um, Napoleon actually loses the battle at first, but then he's able to call in Dessay, who arrives just in time, and then attack the Austrians, who expected that victory was complete, and now it's just about pursuing the French. I think the Austrian commander had even gone home for lunch, I think, and um, not lunch, I think it was uh, uh, yeah something something um, afternoon food or whatever you call it, uh, dinner and um, it uh, and Napoleon comes back the second in command is completely overwhelmed and he wins the battle from there eventually defeats the empire within months a peace treaty is signed by all European powers including the UK their arch enemy in France, Napoleon put an end to 10 years of revolutions and instability and is rewarded with the title of lifelong consul. He was actually originally consul with three other people. Um, uh, with two others, I'm sorry. Um, but um, the two other consuls are not really all that active as consuls and he kind of completely over completely like takes over the role as uh, head of the French government, and eventually he just removes them, uh, the two other consuls, and becomes at first ten years uh, consul for ten years. But eventually he's able to kind of force the French government to vote him to get um, to become consul for life. Napoleon takes advantage of peacetime to reform the country. He reforms the administration, economy, and education. He begins writing the civil code and completely restructures the country's army. Beyond France, he continues with his expansionist and interventionist policy by redrawing boundaries at will, which angers other powers, especially the United Kingdom, for whom France is too big a risk. Aware of the situation, Napoleon sells Louisiana to the United States to finance future wars and... Which he had only just gotten, I think, two years before this because... Um because of a diplomatic deal he made with uh, Spain, who is his um, uh, ally at this time. And um, he had, I think that he had given them some like, some territories in Italy. It was like a secret deal that made. And that's how he got it. So, um, yeah. 
and to prevent the territory from falling into the hands of the British. War resumes, but the UK cannot afford to attack France on its territory and instead decides to focus on diplomatic efforts to rally other powers. Napoleon, who narrowly escaped an attack, knows his life is in danger. He tries to sustain the new French model by creating an empire, hoping that the revolutionary values remain strong even if he were to die. On December 2, 1804, Napoleon becomes the emperor and crowns himself and his wife Josephine in Notre Dame de Paris. He implements a more authoritarian regime. From a military standpoint, he makes Spain go to war against the United Kingdom because he needs its military fleet. Having now brought together enough armies along the channel, Napoleon is ready to invade the United Kingdom. Well, that was really good, I think. Um, yeah, kind of, I suppose, short video, but yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to see the, west, uh, the rest of it, the two other parts. So anyway, um, hope you liked that. If you liked the video, like it, I, like it, I suppose, and uh, subscribe if you want more.